fit into larger communities, uh, and they're easier to step away and actually not be detected. It's pretty hard to deliver a nuclear weapon without people knowing who you are. It's somewhat of a suicide attempt, but certainly biological and chemical weapons are easier. And that's why verification is really important. Now, when I was undersecretary until 2013, we, we do big, big weapons. But obviously the proliferation of small arms is really, I think, what is one of the scourges uh, for uh, people in Syria and other places around the world, uh, Afri parts of Africa. Um, it's really a game of small arms. It's a game of uh, raiding communities. Uh, it's about first a series of holdups to get the cash and then going to the James Bond Bazaar and buying as many as you can. And there are a number of countries that are in the business of selling these weapons, some of them third hand, but it's very, very important that we are able to track the weapons, try to interdict them. Uh, two ways to do it, one is to get, keep people away from the money, and the other way is to keep them away from the weapons. One of the most successful ways of doing that, believe it or not, is to use somebody else's money, we call it OPM, other people's money, to buy the weapons before the bad guys get their hands on them and try to melt them down. That's a very active business right now. We actually have, I understand we have some law enforcement perhaps at this table, but on the federal level in the United States, we have big groups of people that are out there in the market looking at Craigslist, looking at other parts of the dark web, trying to identify who the sellers are. They're highly portable. They cross borders all the time. Simple panel trucks filled with arms all through Europe, all through Eastern Asia, and in the United States and Canada and Mexico. And so it's important to know where these weapons are going. So that's why verification is a really important key. It's a key for the federal level so that we can interdict. It's a key for law enforcement because in the United States and in many markets around the world, many of our allied markets around the world, it is law enforcement who are the most vulnerable to these weapons. A lot of the weapons are used against peoples and populations in very vulnerable places, especially in countries like in, in continents like Africa. But most of the time, they're used by petty thieves and criminals to get money. Money that feeds the system so that they can go get more arms. So the whole idea of having an active press uh, and an active media at large that can quickly understand what kind of weapon it is, who trades in that kind of weapon, is it a first market, second market, tertiary market? Where are they coming from? So that we then can, at an international level, interdict them, either by buying them, or one of the favorite things to do, stealing them back. Um, then you keep them off the street. You keep them away from communities, you keep them away from harming law enforcement, and you keep them away from harming peoples around the world. Um, when I was in the Congress, this was really not an issue that we dealt with at the federal level. It's only been, I think, in the last five to seven years that the whole idea of a kind of third market for small arms. And so small arms are anything, frankly, that you can carry on a person mount on a truck, but is effectively used against people. And so it's anything from small guns to things that you can mount on a truck. Some of them are legitimately assault weapons, so they're not really meant to hunt deer. They're meant to kill people very, very quickly and very messily. And these are the kinds of weapons that in the United States we had a ban against. It was called the Assault Weapons Ban. It was passed in 1996. When it expired, the Congress refused to extend it. And so you see things in the United States 
uh, like the big tragedies we have uh, in, in schools, in movie theaters, shopping malls. Uh, we're lucky in the United States so far that we haven't had any major um, weapon of mass destruction incident. But I think we all think that we're on an egg timer for that. And so the practice of surveillance, verification, interdiction, which is effectively where we need your help, goes from small to big. Once you understand how to look at different marketplaces, how to move goods and things across markets, the markets where people understand how people sell things, understand how they get paid, all of that is applicable to bigger weapons. All of that is applicable to things that are more easily portable, more easily made miniature. It includes things like chemical waste, biological waste, radiological waste, which are effectively the, the future components for weapons of mass destruction. The idea that somebody's likely to steal a weapon, one of our weapons in the United States, some deployed around the world, is probably at less than 1%. But stealing radiological medical waste from a hospital, easy. All you have to do now is do it 10 times. You do it 10 times and you can aggregate something that really is going to be a huge mess. And so it's also more likely to be used. So it's important that we create the ability to surveil, to analyze, and then interdict. And part of it's the money pattern, and part of it is just understanding who the bad guys are. Bad guys are like a lot of other people. They like to go from small to big. So the people that are selling arms now, their ambition is to be doing radiological something in five years because that's really where the money is. And so the future entrepreneurs of, of the weapons game have to be identified, they have to be surveilled, and then we have to interdict. So I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, I'm not doing this anymore. I actually sit on three public company boards and spend a lot of time doing cyber work, but I remember a little bit about how it worked. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I, I have um, to start everyone off. Um, we've obviously had the OPCW report recently on the Khan Sheikhoun chemical attack that took place on April 4th where uh, they've established sarin used, used in the attack and it seems always certain that it was, uh, at least in my opinion, that it was the Syrian government who was responsible. Now, after the, um, uh, the process of dismantling uh, these chem this chemical weapon program, um, obviously them using it again uh, shows that it didn't go very well. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on you know, maybe why that didn't go uh, quite according to plan. So OPCW got the Nobel Prize for uh, working between the United States and Russia to rid Syria of its chemical weapons. And um, it was a very big production to try to get them aggregated from all of the different dumps where they were being held, worked with the Russians. We created a safety corridor to move the trucks with the stuff on them and move them into Lebanon and take them out by ship. Um, it was a lengthy process. It took about 10 months. Uh, everybody said that uh, all of the chemical weapon stocks uh, had been verified to have left. I think at the time, considering that the Russians were helping do this, I think at the time, uh, people actually believed that they had gotten everything out. But chemical weapons are like, Tomorrow's soup, as long as you've got a kitchen and you've got some of the basic uh, components and elements of what you need, you're going to have soup. And I think it's very clear that some months after all of this was verified that the Assad regime decided they were going to start again. The question is whether the Russians were helping or not. Now, in order to get the precursor chemicals, somebody had to be paying attention and somebody, be, I think, had to be helping. Uh, where were those 
cooking factories. Why weren't people reporting them? Uh, this is hot. I mean, to make sarin, you have to have a death wish. It's very, very volatile. So the idea that people were, you know, in the middle of the rubble of some place in Syria making sarin is just crazy. Uh, but apparently that's what they were doing. I believe it was made in Syria. Um, hard to prove. We haven't really found uh, where those kitchens were. But my sense is that everybody believes that basically it was there. So people on the ground, people in the media, average citizens, they need to have information in order to be able to um, understand what it smells like, what the after effects are, what people look like that are going to work in a sarin making kitchen. Uh, people walking around in moon suits, which is pretty much what you have to wear to make it, don't look like you're walking around Raqqa. But apparently there was enough of a factory there uh, where they were able to make enough for Assad to have the barrel bombs filled up. So once again, this is about people feeling as if they have people to go to that they can talk to, that they can trust, and that there is a verification regime and investigations so that people can find a way to stop this from happening in their communities. Anybody else have a question? Yes? Ms. Stanford. Uh, I'm from Ukraine. I'm parliamentarian. Uh, also, I'm uh, from the Committee for Foreign Affairs. My question is, how does the development of the technology impact your, our ability to verify, surveil, and interdict the uh, modern uh, arms? During the morning session, we saw that, on the one hand, good guys have more instruments to uh, find them, to track them, you know, and then to prove that they are doing their bad things. But at the same time, uh, presumably, they can use the same technologies to communicate better, to deliver better, to contact better, and so on. So what is the plate, play of state at the moment? Uh, and uh, how do you see whether we cope with the challenges of the technologies in terms of the control over the arms at the moment? Yeah, Thanks. No, that's a great question. So. In the small arms business, there are some uh, truths that everyone understands. The first is, um, of course, it's a cash business. It's not as expensive as some of the bigger arms, but depending on how much you're moving, it's probably in the tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's a cash business. These weapons are heavy. They're almost always in trucks. So if you're just kind of watching where things are going, how things are going, uh, if you're seeing certain kinds of trucks moving, um, CCTV is very important. Understanding what le what's leaving a port. A lot of these uh, shipments of small arms come by ship. They go on a truck. They move out of the port. They go to a central location like a depot. This is very much like what FedEx does. They break the packages down, so you have a truck full, and they drop it down to five. Now you're in the panel truck business, and five trucks leave, and they dr go deliver the trucks, uh, and somebody's going to get the cash. That's 100% of how they do it. The question is, how do you start to get some sense for it? So things like trusted traveler. Uh, once you identify a state that becomes an intermediary for this kind of business, then what we want to do in the United States is, because we're concerned about um, any kind of WMD in the hold of a ship coming into one of our ports, it would be a devastating e economical attack. You know, if you have a port like New York, somebody comes in with a ship and actually contaminates it, everything there, untouchable for days, weeks, months, that's a big hit economically. So what we have is a system called trusted shipper. It's like trusted traveler. Certain companies, FedEx, DHL, they, they do a lot of work to aggregate information. So these are the guys are not using those. They're using something else. So they're coming through certain kinds of states, probably 15 to 20 states. We're watching those states. We're watching what's going into those ports from the outside into the port. 
We're watching what's going on to certain kinds of ships. We're watching them from the air and by satellite. We're watching the ship. And if we feel the ship has too much bad stuff on it, don't come here. And so it gets pushed away. And after a while, that ship's got to find some place else to go. And now we're tracking it. And we, you know, the United States with partners, we interdict a tremendous amount of small arms that way. But it depends on how much do we get. We don't get them all. So they are going to come into a port. They're, they are going to go onto a truck. So we need surveillance coming out of ports, understanding who these trucks are, watching the trucks, watching them from satellites and from drones and other ways, and then following them down, capturing the small arms and capturing the money, trying to get the bad guys. But it's an imperfect system. So we need more people to do what we believe is the smart thing to do, and that is in their own ports, making sure that they know what's on ships. So a trusted shipper system so that you can, keep th you can have things stand off your port until you know it's on there and maybe not even let it in. Or when it comes in, you're tracking everything that's leaving that port. You have a picture of every license plate of every truck, bill of lading. You're matching that com with a computer. But you're also looking for brand new corporations, corporations less than a year old, uh, banking relationships that are a little squirrely, people that do a tremendous amount of cash business. Those little things become obvious that they are leading you to look at somebody who is not just a nice business person. But, you know, these other side, as you said, the other side is very smart. You know, they know how to create front businesses. They know how to create front businesses that look just okay. They know how to create banks account, bank accounts that look just okay. So that you have now the ability to investigate them, but you're going to get stopped because they look just okay. They're not like complete foul balls. So it's important to be able to look at companies and make sure that you've got good law enforcement investigating skills, but unfortunately, they're just a little ahead of us at times because they're smart. And, um, but the thing we have on our side is that it's a cash business. They've got to figure out how to get paid. In order to get paid, they've got to figure out how to launder the money. That's not as easy as it sounds. And that these are heavy, the weapons themselves are heavy. And so they come in bulk. And bulk is hard to, hard to hide. And when it's hard to hide, it's easier for us to find. Anybody else have a question? I think we've got time for one more. Um, hi, my name is Eric Woods. I'm a contributor to Bell and Cat. Um, one of the articles and investigations I worked on with Bell and Cat was the proliferation of weapons in Syria, more specifically the shoulder-fired anti-aircraft missiles. Um, and my question for you is, how do we build better controls um, with regional partners to prevent the diversion of weapon, deadly weapons before they end up on YouTube? Right. Um, before they end up being sold on Telegram to whoever wants to buy them. Right. No, I think that, that that's the antecedent problem. Um, so uh, for, for 20 years that I know of, the United States government has had a bounty on those weapons and has paid good cash for them. And we're pretty smart about paying just enough more than the bad guys will pay. So we do uh, take a lot of them off the market, um, not all of them. Uh, the ones that are on the market, by the way, are pretty unreliable. Uh, so <laughs> the, the good, good news, bad news is, is that the bad guys pay cash money for something that only works about half the time. Uh, I'm not really worried about them, but it's important for us to, to be able to... There are a number of ways to interdict. The first one is don't, don't put it in the secondary market. And so if we're out there buying things and we're buying... But, you know, we, we see in the United States every once in a while uh, a city or a community will have an amnesty period to sell handguns. And people will sell handguns. 
and then five years later, three years later, somebody will get shot with a gun and they'll find out that it's something that had been sold in an amnesty program, but the other side of the transaction wasn't completed appropriately and the weapon wasn't destroyed and it comes back out onto the market. So the best thing is for us to be there first, uh, to put the highest price we can, reasonable price there, just outprice the bad guys uh, and get these weapons before they go to the secondary market and, uh, and then destroy them and make sure that, that they're destroyed. But I thank you all for being here. I know that this is uh, very important work. It's great to see so many young people involved in something like this. We, um, we at the Atlantic Council, I sit on the board of the Atlantic Council, we're really thrilled that we can do this. This is really the future. Uh, being able to use technology, being able to use mass media, being able to use the internet, uh, being able to use p really smart people in communities around the world to help us fight what is a scourge and a growing threat, because believe me, small arms is one thing. These are people that want to graduate to bigger arms. They want to graduate to bigger arms and then things that can make you glow in the dark. And so let's not let them graduate. Let's not let them feel as if they are successful entrepreneurs. Let's put their asses in jail. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good to see Thank you. Thank you very much. Out of thoughts.